Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's wine virtual wine tasting. But it comes with a kicker. We got a fantastic meal that you can enjoy with your eyes as we go through some perfect wine pairings at Tierra Sur, located in Oxnard, California, in the Herzog Winery. Uh, we got at the center there. We have Joseph Herzog, also known as Mati California Herzog. We got wine to his right or to your left. We have winemaker Joe Herleman, and to his left or your right, we got Chef Gabe Garcia. Fantastic lineup here tonight, and we have, of course, all the way from the East Coast, from uh, New Jersey, Jay Buxbaum, who will be hosting this event. So we're going to turn it over to Jay. And take it away, Jay. Hey, first of all, thank you all of you for joining us, signing up. Uh, we're in for a real special surprise, surprises and treat. Just a, a quick intro, and then I'm going to let the guys at Tierra Sur do most of the talking. In fact, all of the talking, unless they need some insights. But Joe Herleman, our winemaker, sitting to um, uh, Mati Joseph Herzog's right to your left as you're looking at the screen. I, first of all, I love you guys wearing those shields. Those We're in California. <laughs> it's social distancing all in. We don't want to be shut down in the middle of this live feed. <laughs> uh, we are wearing face shields. We could still do this. So we're good. Okay, so a little background about Joe Herleman. Joe Herleman is truly one of the greatest sadikim I've ever met, meaning one of the greatest righteous men I've ever met. He's honest, he's fair, he's brilliant, he's kind, he's charitable, he's all of those things. But most of all, he's an amazing, ama for this purpose is anyway, he's an amazing winemaker and has done a great job. Uh, to Mati Joseph Herzog's left and to your right is Gabe Garcia. And Gabe Garcia is, has done an amazing job in, in you know, just making this, and, and I know I'm prejudiced, but making Tierra Sur restaurant perhaps, not perhaps, I think the best kosher restaurant on earth, one of the best restaurants, period, anywhere. And what's very interesting about both of these two guys is they have something very much in common. Joe Herleman took over the reins from his previous mentor and our first winemaker, uh, Joe, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Peter Stern. And Peter Stern was focused entirely. You know, I talk about what is the unique selling proposition of each of the wineries when I when we did the Israeli things. And the unique selling proposition of, of Herzog is balance. They're always looking for perfect balance. And what's great about Joe Herleman is that even though he started as the associate or assistant winemaker to Peter Stern, he not only took on the mantle of winemaker, but took Peter Stern's perfect balance to a whole nother level with a whole ton more wines. What's interesting about that is, is that uh, uh, Gabe Garcia was also, I believe, this first sous chef to Todd, who actually was a magnificent chef, great chef, and really set the stage for Tierra Sur. But what, what Gabe did was he too uh, punched it up another notch. And today, uh, Zagat and so many others rate uh, Tierra Sur, one of the best restaurants, certainly the best kosher restaurant that I'm aware of, and one of the best restaurants throughout California. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to the man who's once again has taken the reins from, you know, the, our big chief, uh, Hancho David Herzog, who is now our chairman, uh, no longer the day-to-day -day operating guy, who's made, who's made everybody both wonderfully crazy and wonderfully loved, and uh, Joseph Mati Herzog, has done an, also an amazing job by stepping it all up, buying new vineyards, and throughout the next couple of sessions on Herzog at the Herzog Wine Sales, we'll hear about it. But Joe, Mati, it's all yours. Thank you, Jay. Uh, amazing introduction. I will agree with your introduction on Joe Herleman and on Gabe. I'll disagree with myself. <laughs> um, as you've said, Joe and Gabe they both have definitely left their mark in the food and in the wine. Like you said, Peter Stern and then Joe took over, but he has left his mark and we have moved way ahead. And the same thing on the food side, Todd was the one to start up, open up the doors, but we have moved on and the train is moving and we have a conductor that is leading it with his mark on everything he does. And that's, we're really proud of that. 
So we're going to start off our night. We have an amazing experience set, more for us, I think, <laughs> than the viewers. But all of you viewers, you will be getting the the menu and the... Um, I think the pairings and... The I menu and the pairings. Recipe, that right? you could, something like that, maybe? I don't know. That you will be able to replicate what we're doing here. Exactly, exactly. So you'll get the recipes. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. You will be getting the recipes so you could replicate the food and wine pairing that we are so lucky tonight between Gabe and Joe here. So we're going to start with the lineage rosé. Lineage rosé, Joe, let's talk a little bit about the vineyard, where it comes from. And Gabe, you'll speak about why we chose the wine, the food, and pairing. So this is the 2019 Lineage Rosé. Comes from a vineyard in Clarksburg, uh, California, Sacramento Delta. It happens to be Pinot Noir. Um, very lightly pressed and uh, made into wine. Very fresh, clean flavors and uh, just a tad of uh, sweetness to it. We could smell better with these masks than we would have. <laughs> like we get all the It really focuses it right in our face. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. You know what? You should create a, a, like a, a tasting mask now. We could do a whole new industry here. That's it. We put it here and all we get is this nose of the wine and we don't smell the food. <laughs> I like the brightness of this rosé, so. crisp, and we'll see how it meshes together with the food. Chef, what did you think while we were tasting the wine and you came up with this dish? Well, the way we've been trained and the way I was taught here at Terracer is we kind of follow seasonality. We kind of let uh, nature take its own little course and uh, plan our menu for us. So uh, there's an abundance of stone fruit right now in the West Coast. We have some beautiful peaches, so we wanted to embrace that. And when we were tasting the wine collectively together, we came up with an idea of, uh, I think Joe chimed in with a little grilled peach. So that's what we did. We have three types of peaches here. We have a donut peach, we have a grilled peach, and then we have some white peach. They all been prepped a little differently with some almond feta, and then a little bit of honey, olive oil, and some herb, some spring onion, and then simple, just salt and a little pepper. Pinot Noir, of course, is a, a famous wine to make rosé out of. Um, tell me about the lightly pressing, the Sanyi versus lightly pressing, or is it the same? I'm very fond of Pinot for Rosé. So this was done in a very classic style. The fruit came in, full cluster pressed, and we pressed it for Rosé. So very short length of uh, skin contact, just the length of time it took to press it. If it was a Sanyi, that is done to improve the color of another wine. So if you have a Pinot Noir or a Syrah and you want to intensify their color, you can actually pull off the clearer juice very early on during the uh, fermentation process. So you're actually pulling clearer juice off of the must. And then by doing that, you're going to intensify the color because you're having less juice in contact with the same level of skin. That would be a signet. This so is actually a pressed wine um, done where it had no skin contact at all other than the pressing. Very gentle. I love Pinot for rosés, always have. It was a great yeah. choice to uh, do these on the grill, the peaches on the grill, because I think that brightness of the peach, but a little bit of the grill note really pairs nicely from Rosé. Good job. Thank you, Joe. Thank and you. I love this, this uh, almond faux cheese. I right? love this. I it's love good, right? almond really faux good. cheese. Yeah. Well. I, I have to say that. I was, ta I was always taught to be opposed to it, but I, I, the doors are opening for it because there's quality has changed since like I started cooking. Um, there's some great vegan cheese that we all could use and mix into our you know, meat, yes. meat dishes. And on the finish, how did you get, get that high tone of the cheese note to it? Sort of, uh, oh, it's just a little wannabe brine. Oh, what, really? Yeah. Ah, yeah. very good. So, so Gabe, you actually made the cheese. Mm. It's not bought. It's not purchased. Beautiful peaches. We bought the cheese. It's a vegan feta that you can buy any store shelf. And what you do is because you could taste them right away and you'd be like, oh, what's lacking? 
So we made a brine with a little bit of salted water just to enhance it. And we let it soak in there and then we pull it out. Really Amazing. on the finish, you can get that. I awesome. love it. Love it. Chef, how do you like the pairing and what are, what are your notes here? Oh, r right away, the smell is amazing. And, you know, rosé all day, as they say, um, especially out here when it's hot. Right now it's hot. So it was, we chilled the plate along with the wine. So we wanted to make sure the pairing was going to be impeccable. Um, if anything I could add to this salad would be a little crunch texture and maybe a little almond oh, yeah. or a little nut. Um, like I said, we collectively came up with this idea, and I thought it, it worked out very well. And you would do a toasted almond or yeah, toasted something nut, nutty, just, uh, right? Just to bring back some yeah. more texture, right? That would be wonderful. Uh, this question is for Joe Herleman. We have a 19 rosé in front of us. Will this wine age, and how long will it remain fresh and wonderful? For a rosé, I always like to consume them within a year, year and a half. Uh, you really are looking for that clean, fresh fruitiness, and you're going to start to get age components if you let it sit for more than about a year and a half after it comes onto the uh, market. Now, this rosé has not seen any oak. No oak. Stand are there rosés that have oak? What is the differences between rosés that have oak and rosés that don't have oak? Well, you, I guess you would see a difference in body. So you might see a difference in body and also flavor profile. You're going to tone down the uh, fruit and increase something like spice or vanilla coming from the oak. But you can overpower rosé very easily with oak. So it's more of a sophisticated, not your fun everyday rosé. Um, it, in my opinion, if you barrel for men a rosé, you may limit the flexibility of the rosé. So it's going to only be for certain foods. And I would do very neutral barrels, not much oak at all. New oak. Chef Gabe, what did you do with the peaches? Like different methods and so different peaches. There were three types of peaches we got. We just got a classic nice uh, roasted peach. Um, what I did is just salt, salt it and backpack it. Uh, just to intensify oh, some of the flavor. Minimum. The donut peach, minimum. I actually put with rice wine vinegar and some You did? Honey. Yeah. So you to get a little pickleness. I love it. And then uh, we cut that super thin so yeah. we didn't want it to overpower anything else on the dish. And then uh, the white peach was just salted and grilled. Ah. And we're going to start speaking about the Alberino. What is this? All this weird stuff. I mean, we spoke about it. Of course, I'm setting you up for this. But it's Chardonnay, Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you know, you did all kinds of weird, you did a rosé, you did an Alberino, you did a quartet. What? And the next two are not Cabernet as well, right? <laughs> What's going on here? And why, did you, why did you decide to do it this way? Chardonnay. Because, let me explain it. Being here in the winery, working with artists, we constantly try other things. And it comes into the wine business, we're busy with Cabernet, Cabernet, Cabernet. It's going to be a Lake County. It's going to be a Napa Valley. It's going to be a Valhalla. It's going to be a Lake, Paso Robles. We keep on speaking Cab, 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 Cab. Well, we look at it differently. Same as when you go to a restaurant, you look at the menu and you decide what you're going to have. And when you come back a week later or a month later, you're going to have something different. You want to see what the chef is doing. And the same thing when you go to the florist and you buy flowers for Shabbos. You're not going to buy the same bouquet of flowers over every week, every, after week after week, the same flowers. And when you go on vacation, you're not going to go on the same spot over and over again. That's boring. Well, the same thing is true with the wine. So we decided to do something different. We decided to pair the wines that you do not typically go to and speak about the wine, speak about the food, speak about pairing, and have everybody. The message that I could say tonight, be open-minded, Go into your wines as you would, your flowers, your food, your vacation, and let your palate taste, <clears throat> let your palate see what's available, and enjoy all different types of wines, all different varietals of vines, wines, and not just the same boring wine. What is Albarino? Uh, you know, people... There's a few different wines that Joe loves as an artist. It's not necessarily the wine that as a winery we're going to go ahead and do, but as the artist that Joe is, these are different wines that he wants. One of them is Albarino, the other one you're working, Grenache. Grenache There's many different ones. That's Joe as a winemaker likes to have his 
colors, his brushes, to be able to paint the mm -hmm. painting that he wants to paint. So we have told Joe, go ahead, find the fruit that you like, and go ahead and make that wine. Let it express whatever you want it to express. And Alberino is definitely one of them. I love it. Joe, go ahead and speak for yourself about the wine, but right. it's a phenomenal wine. So this is the 2018 Albarino. Um, it is a white grape that has been grown in Spain near Portugal. So it is near the coast of uh, Spain, near Portugal. And it is a wine that really is perfect for seafood. So tonight we're having the halibut with it. Um, has beautiful guava, tangerine notes. This wine also was not put into oak um, because I don't think it would actually improve the quality. It has plenty of body on its own um, to pair perfectly with this halibut we have here. Let's try it. Chef, when we were originally going to taste the Albarino first and then do the rosé second, you tasted this wine and you said, no, 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 I think there's much more going on. Let's change stuff around. Let's change the menu and put it in second. What were you thinking? Why did you decide to change? What was it in the wine that you put it to second place because you, of what you thought of it? So let's talk about that first wine one more time. There's extreme amount of finesse in that wine. And I thought, man, it has a soft little touch to it. Let's not, let's start the meal fresh and light. Now, when we tasted the Arborino, and just like Joe said, it's a Spanish wine, usually in the coastal region. Uh, Gal what's it called? Gal Galania? I forgot what region. But a lot of paella would be, you know, paired yes. with this or a, a seafood dish of some sort. So right away, it was like, okay, we can get to that next course. And I wanted to mimic butter. And you came up with that great idea of sabayon. So we did a sabayon with a little bit of Arborino and some lemon. Um, I just picked some local vegetables from my organic farmer. Uh, he grew some shishitos and some kombucha squash that we just tossed with garlic and we roasted. So we wanted to enhance all these flavors and play with chili and play with this. So this wine would blossom everything. Beautiful. Tell us about the vineyard that the Albarino comes from. Where, where's it from and why is it different or special? So since it's really grown in Spain near the coast, I really focused in on an area of California called the Edna Valley. That is in San Luis Obispo. Uh, I spent about eight years in Edna Valley um, at another vineyard, uh, helping establish uh, a vineyard for Syrah, Grenache, and uh, Viognier. So uh, I was very, very excited. I knew this vineyard. Um, called Paragon, and uh, I thought that it would be perfect. And coming, going out there, you can see that you have the coastal influence of the fog coming in early in the morning, but then a nice wind coming up in the afternoon, so it doesn't get extremely warm there and great coastal influence. So uh, I, I can't pass up Edna Valley for uh, Pinot, Syrah, or Albarino. Why is that coastal influence so much more important than white wines or pinots versus your big bull cabs in Syrah? Um, because you really don't want so much heat influence in your um, whites. You want them to be cooler area so they can really focus on showing what they have to offer. And uh, they have thinner skins. It's not the same kind of... Um, um, great as a, a thick skin Cabernet Sauvignon or thick skin Merlot or something like that. Gabe, what wine would you suggest with an artichoke appetizer? And of course, you don't have to be a wine expert, just what, you, what do you love? What do you think would be great with an artichoke appetizer? This artichoke would go perfect with his, I don't know, it uh, would. I, I mean, go perfect, especially if you're going to use something rich uh, to dip it in, uh, an aioli or oh, some kind of sort. Um, uh, one dish we could have added olive, which is like another richness mm -hmm. to this dish, and I would it would have really worked well with this wine. Um, artichokes, 
you know, they have a cooling effect, I don't know, on your palate yeah. when you eat, eat them. It's, it's almost like a menthol kind of thing that happens. So you got to be very uh, cognizant of that. So whatever you're pairing a wine with it, you got to make sure it's going to be able to balance it out right or, you know, overpowered enough so you don't get that effect. Um, usually when you dip it in melted butter or some sort of fat, it kind of takes away that on your tongue. So a nice chilled wine, uh, champagne would go great with that. And, yes. Uh, you know, uh, it's just, you could fry them too. So any any white, any nice white would yeah. go work well with artichoke. Oh, uh, our Chenin Blanc would be awesome. This Arborino would be awesome. Yes. I mean, list of, a list of Herzog wines would be great for it. All right, the next wine we're going to be tasting is going to be the Herzog Special Reserve Pinot Noir. I'll take the floor a little bit speaking about the Pinot Noir. The first year Herzog did a Pinot Noir was in 2006. We did a real beautiful burgundy style of Pinot, light, elegant, floral. And then the next year we did one which is more California style Pinot, which was a bigger, heavier Pinot with a big with a backbone. And then we went away from doing it on Herzog. We did it as a small little winery project called Eagle's Landing. But this year, I could say that our customer base has gotten a little bit more educated and slowly they've been asking for Pinot, especially around Passover, Pesach. They wanted a lighter wine, more elegant, so they, you could start off the Seder with something light instead of big and heavy. And we brought back the Herzog we Pinot did. Noir. Now, the, this Pinot Noir, we'll talk over the wine, is just so fantastic, so amazing. It has the leather, it has cherries, it has rose petals. I really am excited and I enjoy this wine. It's almost my weekly wine that I use for Shabbos. I had this uh, last week when we were planning this, and I'm just in love with the dark, dark fruit of this, Bing Cherry. Um, beautiful uh, rose petals and this is a Pinot that I've done with a little bit more new oak than usual I'm normally at about 20% new oak but this one I went closer to 35% and that really brings beautiful vanilla notes to it and a spicy note to the wine just uh, showing really really nice I am so happy with this wine I love making Pinot Noir. I like to describe Pinot Noir almost as, if you're looking at a garment, you have cotton, you have wool, this is silk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way it wears on you, yeah. the way you're delicate about it. The tannin structure is very silky on the mouth, just really, really showing nicely. And you could comp you compare food with this wine way different than any other wine. Yes, yes. Right? Yes, you there's can. There's more yes. layers, there's more yes. going on. It's not one dimensional. Yes. There's all these stuff going on. Yep. What I think is interesting, and no one's mentioned it yet, but I'm sure one of our listeners is going to eventually, but I'm going to hop them out, so to speak. I'm going to up, up on them. And that is, is that- Jay, you got, always want on the- we, we got two Pinot Noirs on the table. Totally different wines. And yet, both made from the same grape. Please explain. Okay. Well, the Pinot Noir was harvested uh, for the rosé was harvested about 21 bricks from a region called Clarksburg. The, this Pinot comes from Santa Rita Hills in the Santa Barbara County and uh, really intense, done as a red wine. Um, it comes from a very shallow soil that's basically 100% uh, sand. Uh, Santa Rita Hills is really on the coast near Lompoc. And uh, that's an area that at one time would be uh, ocean. So it's very sandy. Um, Chef, when we were tasting the wine and you came up with the dish, give us some back notes oh, well, I mean, and for the listeners. I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, this, this the Pinot was so good. It, it, it kind of sat me back and really like, the, the gears started grinding in my head. We were one direction and then we went another direction and I was, Thinking about flavors, you know, usually I have a, you know, an index of flavors in my mind, you know, I call it, duck, yeah, flavor profiles, it. right? We're going, okay, this is naturally going to go with this. And you want some richness and we're trying it with this. And then literally the next day I sat home and I was talking with some of the other colleagues and I go, you know what? We're just going to do classic roast chicken because it's all about the wine. Um, we did a classic pairing of cherries because there's beautiful cherries going on right now. 
and we just roasted it with a nice uh, celery rack or celery puree with onion. And we did torpedo onions and a little bit of roasted celery. Just wanted to have some earthiness and some sweetness from the celery. And just a little cherry glaze. And we actually use, I'm sorry, we used a little bit of uh, uh, Alexander Cab with the reduction of the wine to go with the cherry juice. But um, overall, we wanted just to really like enhance the wine and not mask the wine. How do you go about pairing food and wine? Well, for me, I know the wines. And then Gabe and I will talk about, well, we have this component, we have that component. Um, what do we really want to pair and what would be the area that we want to focus on to make it the best thing possible? I'm usually, take the punk rock method. I'm not going to lie. I'm usually, okay, I taste the wine, I'm going, okay, what's going to contrast, what's going to make this wine sing? And right away, oh, Joe, we thought, I said, what about smoked barbecue Oh, chicken? yes. That was, I was going crazy. what I, I was, wanted. I was like, Tomatillo and like this and that. And I was like, nah, it's going to kill the wine. So I kind of sat back. But I know if we're at home and we're playing and we're having fun, you know, I was thinking about the sophistication of this wine and yeah. the complexity. And I was like, you know what? I really want to take it back and just <clears> honor <throat> it. And, um, uh, that's what came with, you know, when we ha I just had a bite of parsnip. Parsnip had this vanilla note to it. Mm -hmm. And with the wine, it just goes a whole nother level. It's like, exactly. oh, and then the roast, classic roast chicken, just salt and pepper on the chicken, guys. Nothing crazy. I could ask the question, I want to drink a Zinfandel. How do I pair something to the Zinfandel? Well, or am I asking the question, I want to make a pepper crusted ribeye steak, and what wine is going to stand up to that? Well, I think it depends on your own characteristics. Do you really want the wine to be your focus or do you want the food to be the focus? So if you're a person who likes, you know, a certain wine and you want to pair it with food, you would go to the wine side and say, okay, I want to pair this Zinfandel with something. What should I do? But you kind of like, it'd be good to know what the Zin tastes like before you're going to pair it with the food. 100%. Well, I, Chef, elaborate I, 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 a little well, bit on it. Assam, Assam will always know what wine they have on their list. They already know what the menu that the chef is preparing. They're going to already prepare in their mind what's going to work out best. Um, for instance, I already know like what I'm going to have with our Zinfandel. I already know what I'm going to pair with it. I want lamb with peppers and onions, and I want cumin, I want coriander, because I know it will stand to that because we're all speaking, we know the wine that we produce, you know the food. But to your viewer, let's bring that down a level. Peel the onion one more. You, you have to try the wine first, uh, and that will guide you. And just like when I get ingredients, I try each ingredient raw, because it's <clears> gonna <throat> guide me where I wanna go, right? I'm gonna go, okay, is this a high quality peach? Does it need more time? Does it need more time to ripen? This tomato is a little under. How am I gonna, you know, accentuate this? How am I gonna enhance it? And, it, and it, just with wine and pairing, the same thing is like you want to go, okay, some things don't work well together, but um, that's just me. You know, my palate is different from Joe's palate as long as with yours as well. So as we get, I, I, I really lean to the sweet side of things. So I always want to sweeten things up, you know, instead of like restrain myself. I just, I want to, I want to tell you what I do when I go to a restaurant and I trust the chef, and, and there are a few of them, not a lot, but there are about a half a dozen restaurants where I really trust the chef. You know what my order is? My order is tell Chef Gabe Jay is here. That's my order. And um, I think, and, and I, I bring this up now because of the question about the wine, and Gabe pointed this out, just the same way is how you should trust your sommelier, especially in a place like Tierra Sur. If you have a really good if, if the restaurant has a reputation for having a good sommelier, you'll, you'll, you'll either choose the food first and then say to the, say, say to the sommelier, what, what do you suggest to go with this food? And, you know, invariably, certainly if it's a good restaurant, they'll, you know, they'll hit it right on the head. I got a couple of questions for you. Here's an interesting question from David. Oh, David Mervis. I note that you're using the same, same shape glasses for all the wines. How much difference does the shape of the glass of, of make in the wine taste? That is actually a great question, and I'm going to let both First Chef and, one, and Joe answer that. One of the viewers is asking that they see that we're using all these same glasses 
for all the different courses. How much does shape and size make a difference in the wine for taste, aroma, smell, and so forth? If it's a proper wine glass, <clears throat> I very much think that you could get by with maybe a white and a red gra uh, glass that you don't necessarily need Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Syrah, glasses specific to that. Um, if it has a big enough bowl and the proper size opening, you can really, really get what you're um, going to experience with the glass. Gabe, do you have an opinion? I'm a stickler for glasses, sorry, Joe. That's fine. Um, Especially when I go to you know a nice proper bar, I want a Tom's Calling glass. You know, if I'm having a martini, it's in a martini glass. Um, I, maybe it's just because I was culinary educated in school. Is just some of those things. But at home, uh, to each his own. You know, um, not all of us can afford a Bordeaux glass. Not all of us can afford that expensive bottle of Bordeaux. You know, so I'm a blue collar drinker. So usually, um, it's like whiskey, and <laughs> a nice tumbler. And um, when it comes to a wine glass, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I have you know, quite a few. Um, but it all depends on what you're drinking. You know, you're, you're not going to drink, uh, you know, uh, a martini in a rocks glass unless you want to look cool. Yeah, so I think, Jay, to answer your question, I think it's more in the aroma, not that much in the taste. So the next one is a blend. And it actually has 18% Cabernet Sauvignon in it. <laughs> Uh-oh. But I think the Zin is going to make up for that. I think so, 15%. So just drink the wine and tell me what you're picking up. And Gabe, we'll do the same with you. Dark fruit, um, cherry, spice, oak. And the, cherry, uh, the spice and the oak comes from the barrels. It was uh, about 18% new barrels for this wine and about 18% one-year-old uh, barrels for this wine, French oak. Really dark, brooding um, red wine. It's got some body too, Joe, compared to the Pinot. It does. You know, yeah. Pinot is yeah. really, really like finesse. Joe, how much percent Zin is in here? Because I uh, really, 15%. I love how it's putting yeah. this, all, putting it all together, like meshing it together. But I'm getting the end. I'm definitely getting the finish of a Zin vanilla. Yeah. So, 37 uh, percent Petit Verdot, about 18 percent Cab, uh, about 15 percent Merlot, and 15 percent um, Zin Vanille. And this is 16, right? Yes, this is 16. So this has more oak than your typical reserve blends or reserve wines. Um, yes, it has more newer oak than uh, some of the others. I'm normally at 30% new, unless it's like the chocolate, which tends to be 100% new. So it, you can really, really taste and smell the sweetness and the vanilla coming from yeah. the oak. And that spiciness really pairs well with this wine. It has a bit of a mocha note to it in the mouth. Gabe, what, what fruit do you pick up in this one? Oh, right away, I get dark blackberry, like you said. And then uh, when I, I said beets for some reason, because I got earthiness, you know. But sometimes beets can be, have a tendency to be too sweet. Too sweet. But uh, if you were to roast it really hard yeah. with the skin on, yeah. you're getting oh, this yeah. intense flavor. Why don't you tell us a little bit, not about the food, not about the wine for a moment, just about what the future holds for the Herzog wine cellars, vineyards, uh, you know, new, wine, new wines, new direction. Talk to us. Tell us a little bit about So there's a lot of things going on. In terms of food, we're lucky that we have chef, and the chef goes out and tastes, and he speaks with the growers literally every day, yep. and that basically decides the menu. It's a Farmer John or Tim, they call him and say, okay, this is what we have. This is what we're doing. This is going to be a next week. And he basically creates the menu based on what is going to be available. So it's always unique and exciting. You never come back a week after week and it's just the same thing. It might be the same piece of meat or the same uh, ribeye or the same chicken, but the components and how it's done is all different. The, in terms of the vineyards, Joe could speak to that more, but there's a lot of exciting things. We actually came back from Napa last week. We're going to be replanting a Napa vineyard. We went up with a 4x4 four four up in the hillside. <laughs> right, Joe? Oh, it's awesome. And we have amazing views. Amazing views and certain plots of land which will be coming. Very small. In, 
small vineyards that will be spectacular wines oh. coming out of there. Great. Next week we're planting a new vineyard in Lake County. Um, Clarksburg has been on its own. What we've been able to do, the replanting and changing different orientations and different clones have been amazing. And actually some, we took clean wood from the existing vineyard and we had them tested in the lab to make sure there's no diseases or anything. And we replanted that same grape because we're so excited and we love that grape. And that history goes back actually to 1985 where we started with that vineyard. And that's the reason we purchased the vineyard. So we like the fruit, we know the fruit and want, we wanted to be able to bring that back. So there's all different things happening at the same time. There's the old, or boring that we're proud of and want to continue doing. Then there is the visionary that we're going out and looking for new and unique opportunities to bring into the kosher world. We're constantly out there looking to improve what we're doing. Um, it's amazing at the vineyard in Clarksburg that we are starting to continue to replant um, the different blocks uh, some of them are nearly 30 years old and are getting tired. Um, the vineyard in Napa, Lower Childs Valley, just <laughs> really excited about that. We'll plant next year. Um, so we've been able to ha take the 18, 19, and we'll take the 20 harvest food from it. And uh, the site is perfect for Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay, let's talk about the food, guys. Um, now that we've now that you're let's talk about the food. Yeah, well, the Chef, food. you took a whole different direction over here with this wine. Up until now, I think it was all about yeah, the Brenda. food complementing the wine. Over here, you took a different direction. You went much bigger, bolder, and the wine is actually enhancing the food. Uh, well, I, I, I kept the classic. Braised beef cheek on those yeah. guys. Um, yeah. it, it wasn't a maripaw, which is celery, onion, carrots. And then we just wanted to do something classic to go with this wine, you know? Um, I didn't want to go peppery grilled steak. I wanted it to be unctuous and warm. Um, and when I got to taste the wine, that's how I felt. I felt warm and unctuous like a campfire. And I wanted to eat something that was going to be a pot pie or some sort of this. And um, I, I think if you can make a really decent cholin, you know, no offense, I'm pairing your wine, Joe. With Cholent, but if you can make a good cassoulet, oh, this yeah. would be a perfect wine to go with oh, cassoulet. Very good. Jay, yeah. very good Jay, the next challenge for you is <laughs> wine pairing with Cholent. <laughs> um, no challenge. But um, mm. first sure. and foremost, you know, I'm very fortunate here to just work with these guys and really conceptualize idea to see where Joe wanted to go with with the wine and then where I could implement with food. Um, sometimes I'm afraid to uh, push the boundaries, but usually it's Joseph pushing me go ahead go ahead it's okay like and uh it's really good that we get to you know very fortunate we get to, to play here and uh you guys the customers and uh, okay. are, you know reap the benefits of that tell us the details of this dish okay this is a classic simple braised beef cheek um so uh what we just did is brown the beef cheeks and braise them in some red wine which was uh, uh alexander valley actually yes. <laughs> um, um and uh i use fennel celery onion garlic um, some a little bit of thyme, a little oregano, and that brace for about two hours, uh, 350. Uh, mashed potatoes with Yukon gold, a little bit of sugar snap peas, farm fresh carrots, a little bit of fried parsley and shallot uh, on top as a garnish. And then just took that the, the braising liquid and reduced it and poured it right over like if it was gravy. Nothing fancy. Uh, anyone can do this dish at home and, and be a rock star with it. And this needs a big, bold one. Oh, yeah, for that. sure. Yeah, for that sure. beef cheek. That fattiness, perfect, perfect that richness. Flavors, and, yeah. and that the is richness. so tender, you can just basically break that up with your fork. And I would mix it in with my Yukon Gold potatoes, because I'm telling you, this mashed potato here, that's sick. They're so good. They are <laughs> sick. We, we got sick. something going I, on I'm here. Just gonna <laughs> mash if you up. viewers are seeing the chemistry <laughs> going on between <laughs> Gabe <sick>. and Joe, <laughs> We look at it as we have a, we're doing a painting and we have a little toolbox with all these colors and brushes. 
And when we don't have everything in front of us, we just are limited in terms of colors or the oh, type 100%. of brushes. It makes us much more creative in terms of what we're going to come out. And we could blend colors together ourselves because we don't have those colors or use the brushes in different ways. And that's how we are successful doing what we do, whether in food, whether in wine. How would, how would the Herzog lineage Pinot Noir versus the special reserve go with the chicken recipe? Now, let's start with, let's end with that for now. And I got a few more after that. Depends which Pinot I had. <laughs> As uh, Gabe said, I would love to try the Herzog Pinot with a uh, dry rub barbecue chicken just to see what it's like. I really want to know what that is because I have a thought that that's going to be amazing. Um, I would say I would go with the uh, ca uh, lineage Pinot Noir with the uh, roasted chicken if I was doing it. I'd save the Pinot Noir for something else. Herzog. The fires affect your your harvest, your grapes? We had a couple of years of fires. We had fires in 18 yes. and we had the 19. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, we had 17 and 18. Yes. 17, we were lucky, Hashem saved us and we picked either a day before the fire or the fire surrounded one of the vineyards but the wind was blowing the other direction so it wasn't damaged at all. For 2018, for the most part, we were saved. Um, there was actually one wine, which is our Lake County wine, which we will not produce in 2018 no. because that got some smoke taint. So that question that you're asking, were we affected? Were other people affected? Yes, very much so. In terms of Herzog and the Herzog Winery House, we were affected with the Lake County 2018. Uh, one of the, this is very important, and there's a lot of talk about it lately. Mavushal, good, bad, does it allow the wine to age as long as non -mavushal? Um I know I have a very strong opinion of that, and it's anecdotal, but I've done a lot of experimentation, and I, I'm hey, very... Jay has opened the can of worms into Mavushal. I'm going to do something very different. <laughs> I'm going to turn to Gabe, to Chef Gabe, and I'm going to ask him if he has had any challenge or he thinks anything of Mavushal or not? No, I don't. Um, you know, when it comes to non Mavushal, I wish I could pour it. <laughs> right? Um, but, but do you feel you, you're missing something out by not having Mavushal? No. Do you feel the quality is different or anything like well, that? Well, of course, uh, obviously, there's a little difference in quality. But is it uh, a thorn in my side? No, not at all. We have this vast library of wines to play with, and uh, the pairs can be endless. Um, uh, but I never ever felt that you know it was hindering us from it, from succeeding. Um, I, I just always see it as a an upper class or an upper you know upper level wine for us. Um, but I, I've never saw it as a difficulty or you know hindrance. So before I go to Joe in this question, I want to tell you guys, literally an hour ago, right before we went on live, <laughs> I opened a bottle of '93 Chalk Hill. That is the first year that we produce the Chalk Hill AVA wine on its own, the limited Chalk Hill. I was afraid when I opened it, okay, let's drink it and move on. But I went back to it and I couldn't let go of that glass. It was becoming more and more alive. And Chef Gabe said, keep my glass, I want to go back to it afterwards. So evidence of a 27-year-old wine that is Mavushal and is phenomenal. I mean, literally, I had tears in my eye. It was a wow moment for me that I can't say in the wine business happens to me all the time, but this was definitely one of those wah or aha moments. Joe, I'll let you speak about the Mavush. Well, um, we're now on our third style of pasteurizer that we utilize for making a Mavush. So I've spent uh, 22 years coming up, 23rd harvest, really focusing and dialing in the way we're making the wine Mavush. So I feel that uh, we really have long-aged wines that happen to be in the bushel. So, you know, I'm happy with the outcome of the wines. That's all I can say. All right. Thank Love you, guys. Thank open. you, Joe. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Jay. And thank you to all our viewers. I want to take this opportunity to open the floor. Uh, people will have the ability to unmute themselves. Um, so for, say, something like... 
uh, this one, you know, something like that. Like, do you want some, would that work well with something lighter like chicken or something like that, you know, more for something like heartier, like a beef, it's the uh, Herzog lineage. I would have steak, something, red meat of yeah. some sort. If I was going to do some kind of poultry, I'd go with goose or yeah. maybe a duck. Something fatty. Yeah, fatty. Rich. Rich. Mm -hmm. Darker meat. Yep. Yeah. It, it it it'll great with lamb. There's nothing wrong. Oh, yeah. Lamb. Lamb, lamb, lamb is yeah. also yeah. big and heavy. Mustard. Yeah. Meat, oh, some crust you know, on top of yeah. roasted. Oh, nice. It'd be perfect. So what would you pair with his chicken that he's eating? Uh, <laughs> Pinot Noir. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, we're just one crack minded tonight, friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question. Is there any 93 Chalk Hill left? <laughs> you got to ask those for the people there. The people selling um, at kosherwine.com. Right. So we actually recently had, um, we had a few bottles uh, recently that we got a hold of from a uh, private seller. Jonathan. And uh, they the sold out cap. the day that they got into the warehouse. They, they sold out right away. We had two cases. Uh, they're gone. And you know, so you know it was stored correctly. What's that? You know that the wine was stored correctly, right? Absolutely. Wow. I have to tell you, that wine was really, really amazing. Stephen Pilat is actually a uh, member, but I'm his wife. I love dark chocolate. So, which wine do you suggest? Maybe even a couple of wines for dark chocolate. A port. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How about a zin, something that is big and spicy? Would that yeah. go? A mole. It would go great with mole. Yeah. And mole. Chocolate. I think mole pans. Yeah, a zin. So mole would go yeah. definitely with yes. zin. Yes, yeah. very much so. Or syrah. Yeah, syrah. Right. Yeah. What about our late heart? I mean, you know, um, Eagles Landing Syrah is you know, one of my favorite wines here. Thank or you. Or the favorite wine here. Thank you. Yeah.